If this were the case, we would have a unified description of all the natural forces. However, I think we still have much to do in this area because the unified gravity theory and the other unified forces theories are theories that simply cannot be tested experimentally yet. This might very possibly be one of the first key missions for the new LHC accelerator, although the experiments that would have to be carried out to do so would require an energy supply about a billion times greater than that generated by current means. Such fabulous magnitude was only generated once, a long time ago, a few million years after the Big Bang. Subatomic physics is now poised to explain, in the near future, realities that are only fantasies at present. We know that someday mankind will be able to travel the 75 million kilometers to the planet Mars in just 10 days. We know that, in a more or less near future, mankind will be able to reach the most distant planets in the Milky Way galaxy. The secret is antimatter one of those favorite buzzwords used by science fiction writers. The story of antimatter began in 1928. The theory of relativity was still fairly novel, and Max Planck had just set out the bases of the quantum theory. It was then when a young British physicist, Paul Dirac, dared to make one of the boldest speculations in the history of science. The existence of an anti-world, identical to ours, but made up of antimatter. Dirac had reached a strange conclusion after trying to come up with a mathematical equation that would make quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity compatible. He came up with two different solutions, actually. One of them was applicable to negatively charged electrons, while the other was feasible if electrons were positively charged, something that nobody had ever hypothesized. Dirac inferred that, for every particle, there must be an identical antiparticle with the opposite charge. To each electron, there had to be an anti-electron. Dirac's conclusions led scientists to start looking for antiparticles. Professor Carl Anderson of Caltech reported the first significant results in 1932. In a series of experiments with cosmic rays, Anderson found a new particle similar to the electron, but positively charged. It was naturally Paul Dirac's anti-electron. Anderson called it a positron, and both scientists were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. In 1955, not long after one of the first large particle accelerators was turned on, a group of physicists at Berkeley University got a look at the first antiprotons. Since then, the discovery of antimatter has become a routine process. Antimatter is basically the opposite of matter. Uh, the, the, there's a standard model. Um, the standard model basically has, consists of quarks and leptons. Okay, so you've got the top quark, bottom quark, uh, charm quark, up quark, down quark, strange quark. There's six of them. You've got the leptons, the electron, muon, and the tau, and you've got their associated neutrinos. Okay? And that's on one side of the chart. On the other side of the chart, you have their mirror image. Okay? And that means that if you have a proton, which is made up of up and down quarks, then an antiproton is made of, of anti-up and down quarks. Okay? So it's basically the opposite. 
it has exactly the same mass, exactly the same but opposite charge. So a proton has a charge of one. An antiproton has a charge of minus one. Okay? Um, they have the exact same mass. They have, as far as we know, the exact same lifetime. If you had an antiproton here and you had a proton here and you let them sit, they would last the same amount of period of time. So it's basically the opposite state of matter. Positronic androids, anti-neutrino planets that pass through the Earth, antimatter worlds, unimaginably long intergalactic travel. Antimatter has been the basis for some of the most intriguing science fiction stories. At the beginning of the 21st century, high energy physicists are hard at work on this subject. In some aspects, their findings probably won't change much. Then again, there may soon be manned space missions to Mars with less than a gram of antimatter as the only fuel. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared in a vacuum. E equals mc squared. The work of Albert Einstein, 1905. It's almost certainly the most widely known mathematical expression of all time. It explains, among other things, that mass is an extremely concentrated type of energy. Physicists tell us that a car engine could run non-stop for 100,000 years on the energy contained in one kilogram of chocolate, of apples, or just about anything else for that matter. The problem is, we don't know how to harness that energy. But we're learning. We're learning how to obtain energy from antimatter, though we still have a long way to go. A collision between matter and antimatter would theoretically produce the greatest abundance of energy imaginable. Nuclear fission, which powers atom bombs and nuclear power stations, only transforms one thousandth of the potential energy involved. Nuclear fusion, the breathtaking process that fires the sun and hydrogen bombs, converts just one percent of its fuel. In a matter-antimatter collision, one hundred percent of the matter involved is converted into energy. Hypothetically, the collision of one kilo of matter and one kilo of antimatter would release an amount of energy equal to that of 43 atomic bombs of the type that devastated Hiroshima. Particle accelerators all over the world are working non-stop in an attempt to generate matter-antimatter collisions. The only problem is the masses they have to work with are too small. When you have a proton hitting an antiproton, everything, even the rest mass, can be used in turning into new energy. So the energy potential is enormous if you have enough particles. Okay? So the first the question is that you can annihilate these two particles and completely turn into energy. The second question is how many particles do you have? Now at Fermilab we produce about one trillion antiprotons, which sounds like a huge number. The real thing is that in a gram of matter, in a single gram of matter, there's about one trillion trillion particles. There's the Avogadro's number, six times ten to the twenty-third. So you have one trillion trillion particles in a gram of matter. So if we only have a trillion antiprotons, then basically any time in our machine, the most we've ever collected is a trillionth of a gram. So it's a small number. They sound like big numbers because you have a trillion particles, but really it's a very small weight. Particle accelerators are the only means we have available for producing antimatter. However, scientists think that when the universe began, some 15 billion years ago, the same amount of antimatter must have existed. This raises yet another of those great enigmas surrounding the standard model for particles and interactions. What happened to antimatter? Why didn't matter and antimatter destroy each other, generating a universe of pure energy with no mass whatsoever? <laughs> 